the presentation of anarchism, anarchism a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Pitfalls of Anarchist Solidarity with Indigenous Communities by Adam Barker. I am a white settler Canadian born and raised on the overlapping territories of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples. I have been involved in radical indigenous and decolonial anarchist politics for many years, which is how I met Audra, a Ganun Sunnianwe resident of the Six Nations of the Grand River and a relentless force for decolonization, and through her, Dali, a Wet'suwet'en activist and community leader who is involved in ongoing struggles in her own homeland and who has stood alongside Audra at several actions. We met and talked several times over the summer and early autumn of 2021, as major community-led movements in defense of land and sovereignty and against the settler state and invasive capitalist corporations increased in intensity in both of their territories. Despite being charged by the Ontario Provincial Police for her participation in these actions, now dropped, Audra was adamant that there were larger issues going on in her community and elsewhere that needed attention. When I offered the chance to speak directly to anarchists around the world through the Anarchist Essays podcast, both Audra and Dali jumped at the opportunity. This essay is the result of those conversations, and while read in my voice, represents the important experiences of Audra, Dali, and many other Indigenous women encountering anarchist activists. Prefiguration, direct action, solidarity, and mutual aid, and fundamental challenges to systems of state and capital. Most anarchists strive for these, and regardless of other differences, agree on their foundational importance. They are also already being made real in many places where indigenous communities are actively reclaiming land stolen or appropriated by the settler colonial state, settler collectives, or individuals. No surprise, then, that Land Back, which has become a popular shorthand and social media hashtag for diverse and international Indigenous efforts to reclaim land and water, seems to attract anarchist-identifying activists or those who engage in an anarchistic organizing and tactics, seeking to help these revolutionary efforts. But despite the commonality of anarchists being drawn into action and organizing around Indigenous land reclamations, successes in terms of achieving positive and effective support for Indigenous struggles are few and far between. More often than not, anarchists and other leftist activists exacerbate existing tensions and divisions in Indigenous communities, take up space and resources, and serve as an excuse for police intervention, among other missteps and faux pas, that lead many Indigenous folks to view anarchists not as potential allies, but as liabilities. This essay started as a reflection on anarchist sociologist Richard Day's analyses of the newest social movements, the increasingly decentered, affinity-based, anarchic, even if not explicitly anarchist, activist movements that began to arise during the era of summit-hopping protests following the battle in Seattle in 1999. Day, a settler anarchist, identified indigenous people's movements as a key inspiration for and potential ally to the newest social movements, for exactly the reasons described above. There are clear parallels in terms of philosophy and action among indigenous resurgence groups and radical anarchist groups. Fifteen years on from this analysis in Gramsci is Dead, published by Between the Lines in 2005, I thought to look again and see if the potential for anarchist and indigenous alliances had developed. That was part of what brought me back in touch with Audra, who has been involved in multiple land reclamations in her home community of Six Nations of the Grand River, a Haudenosaunee reserve in what is currently called Southern Ontario, Canada. The reserve is a fragment, only 5% of a 550,000-acre territory in Canada that the British Crown recognized as belonging to the Haudenosaunee in 1784, called the Haldimand Grant. Over many years, this territory has been squatted, stolen, and otherwise dispossessed from the Haudenosaunee community, which never gave up opposition to this creeping colonization. In 2006, a reclamation of land adjacent to the reserve that had been set up for the development of a private housing subdivision had served notice that the Haudenosaunee community were no longer going to accept continued invasion and destruction of their territory. The success of the 2006 action in part led to the reclamation begun in 2020, as another housing development slated for lands adjacent to the reserve was taken by the community members and renamed 1492 Land Back Lane. 
Audra was involved in both actions, and as it happened, she reached out to me just as I had started seriously considering the thorny issues related to anarchist engagements with Indigenous community issues. Perhaps unsurprisingly, 1492 Land Back Lane had been encountering issues with well-meaning but ineffective and problematic anarchist activists. Audra then introduced me to Dali, whose experience both at Six Nations and in her home Wet'suwet'en territories mirrored Audra's. Wet'suwet'en territory is currently a flashpoint for conflict as government-supported petroleum giants like Canada TC Energy attempt to push through oil and gas pipelines that threaten both Wet'suwet'en sovereignty and lands. We engaged in a sustained conversation on this topic over the summer of 2021, and each time what struck me more than anything else was the pervasive frustration that settler and non-Indigenous activists weren't doing any better than many other green or human rights activists, despite all of the honest attempts at clear communication from Indigenous community members. And so we developed this, an essay by me as a vehicle for Audrey and Delee to express their observations, evaluations, and frustrations shared by many other Indigenous activists directly with anarchists outside their communities in the hopes of changing the strange di strained dynamics between resurgent Indigenous and settler anarchist activist communities. Anarchists are, obviously, not a unified or homogenous group by any means. In fact, one of the reasons I initially started revisiting Richard Day's work is his identification of common anarchist philosophies and strategies spreading among social movements, a trend that has clearly continued, from the anarchic character of some Occupy encampments to the anarchist autonomous zones established in cities like Portland during fights against police violence and racial injustice. And of course, there are Indigenous people who identify as anarchists, or who have learned from and adapted anarchist practice. But we should be clear that the issues we identify here are not with community members who may identify as anarchists or practice anarchistic politics, nor do we mean the many anarchists who have established long-term relationships with Indigenous people and communities which inform their practices, and which do not require an anarchist politics to achieve. Rather, we are discussing here the anarchist activists so often involved in indigenous land-based protest and so often the source of frustration for their hosts, usually young, frequently white and masculine, and almost always with only limited community contact, often with just one or two individuals. Outsider anarchists who come to the aid of indigenous communities, even with the best of intentions, are almost never prepared for the reality that they find on the ground. First, Indigenous communities exist in a massive variety, and simply spending time with or working alongside one community may mean very little in another. How much commonality can there be between a remote northern Cree or Dene community in western Canada and an urban community like the Musqueam, whose territory overlaps with much of present-day Vancouver, or a community like Six Nations that sits adjacent to the urban centres and is surrounded by the most densely populated area of Canada, the Golden Horseshoe around the western end of Lake Ontario? Second, Indigenous communities are rarely fully open with outsiders. With good reason, many Indigenous people believe it is necessary to avoid disclosing too much information with outsiders, even, or especially, those who come with good intentions. Historically, Indigenous people who have shared knowledge with outsiders have been taken advantage of, by missionaries, by anthropologists and archaeologists, by artists and writers, fashion designers, developers, charities, and yes, leftist activists of many stripes. As such, crucial information about how community decisions are made, who favors what position or action, who is compromised or has a history of poor behavior that, that means they are not trusted, and many other topics are considered to be strategically sensitive, too strategically sensitive to be shared. Anarchists, rather than understanding that there are good reasons for them to be kept partially in the dark, have tended to react in one of two ways by either proceeding as if they have all of the information required, which they don't, and making errors, or by demanding more knowledge or information, which is likely to lead to straining community relations. Further to this, many anarchists approach Indigenous communities with a serious romanticism that undermines their ability to perceive subtle but important community dynamics and respond appropriately. Indigenous communities, in addition to being highly varied along lines of nation, culture, socioeconomics, legal status, meaning reserves, Métis settlements, unrecognized urban communities, and geographical placement are often very internally divided. The history of internal conflicts in any Indigenous society goes well past the advent of sustained colonization because, and this is often a shock, Indigenous people are people, and people rarely co collectively agree on all issues. Those who do not research the histories of Indigenous communities they seek to support may approach those communities with unifying rose-tinted glasses, while well, a student of history would know that, for example, 
The Haudenosaunee Confederacy, one of the key political structures relevant to 1492 Land Back Lane, developed out of generations of internecine warfare between five Iroquois nations, the Cayuga, Oneida, Mohawk, Seneca, and Onondaga. There have always been differences in Indigenous communities, at times giving rise to factionalism, and this has only been exacerbated by the pressures of colonialism. While the advent of the Confederacy helped to ameliorate some tensions, national differences remain, and the Confederacy is now further divided by an international border, the boundaries of tiny reserve communities, and along lines of religion, as Christian and traditionalist groups are often in disagreement, or support for forms of governance, as some favor the traditional longhouse governance, while others throw support behind the chief and council elected system, as well as involvement in advocacy for different types, kinds of development. This is not exceptional among Indigenous communities, but typical. In the West, Indigenous communities are often deeply divided by the development of oil and gas pipelines on traditional and usually unceded territory, with some prioritizing environmental ethics and self-governance, and others prioritizing development to address poverty and lack of governing capacity in places where empl employment options are limited. As common as these divisions are, anarchists have a terrible reputation for understanding and accommodating them. When anarchists enter Indigenous communities, they often do so with the idea that there are real Indigenous people, meaning those who speak of tradition and protecting Mother Earth, and who generally have similar priorities to anarchists, and fakes, compradors, or just fooled community members who side with states, corporations, and economic development schemes. Crucially, this drives wedges between different types of community leaders and their supporters, as certain leaders become seen as necessary for securing outside assistance. That outside assistance, though, often fetishizes action above communication, consideration, and deep relationality, which means that anarchists at times choose to hold up leaders whose strategic orientations, willingness to take illegal, risky, or aggressive acts over other avenues of opposition, match their own. This has had the effect of lending weight and tacit endorsement to those tactics, which, while important and useful, are not always the only, the best, or the most useful tactics for generating a strong, cohesive community. This romanticism of indigeneity, that it inherently means indigenous community members will be socialist eco-warriors and anyone who does not match that ideal is not real, leads to anarchists causing community divisions to deepen and conflicts to break out. Anarchists often do not appreciate the networks of kinship in Indigenous communities that are durable in ways that defy political divisions, and that this is the strength of Indigenous community that has allowed them to endure through many trials. As Anishinaabe scholar Hayden King articulated in relation to Indigenous community disagreements that came forth during the Idle No More protests of 2012, it is normal and good for Indigenous communities to internally disagree, but anarchists often treat these disagreements as signs of selling out or similarly untrustworthy behaviour. As Dali noted, in her community there are people who, unlike her, are very much pro-pipeline, and while she has argued and disagreed with them, she also knows that should she need it, those same people would feed, house, and care for her, and many other community members. The bonds of kinship transcend political divisions in many Indigenous communities in ways that, well hard to perceive from the outside, are very real and enduring. As such, anarchists following a common practice of working through affinity may well unbalance community relations, causing tensions, bad feelings, and even open conflict. As Dali revealed, there are key chiefs and leaders in Wet'suwet'en communities who, while personally opposed to pipeline construction and oil and gas drilling, will not publicly oppose these things because to do so would be seen as an endorsement of both problematic indigenous leaders and the anarchist activists who have endorsed and supported them. Dali sees this as a problem stemming from existing internal conflicts in Wet'suwet'en communities being exploited by outside activists for larger strategic gains, and as she explained, she is bound to oppose this. I can't compromise Wet'suwet'en values, she said, and we need to clean up our own house before inviting people in. One of the main issues with anarchists organizing in and alongside Indigenous communities has to do with both traditional roles and social organization, and also a much wider spread problem within and beyond anarchist communities, namely poor gender politics. Indigenous communities often have complex systems of leadership and responsibility, many of which manifest in offices and titles that are passed matrilineally or through women's society and uh, cultural groups. As discussed, these traditional systems are often intentionally obscured to outsiders, and are also affected by centuries of colonialism and racism such that communities are divided on who should hold responsibilities and how these should be exercised.
On top of this, anarchists are not immune to the social pressures of patriarchy that are so widely, uh, so widespread, especially in settler colonies, where national identities are highly reliant on tropes of rugged frontier masculinity. When anarchists come into indigenous communities, they are often unwittingly bringing both unexamined misogyny and sexism with them, as well as more considered ideas about gender and social roles that remain insufficient because they do not take the specific reality of indigenous communities into account. As Delee related, in the anti-logging blockade at Ferry Creek, currently ongoing in Salish territories and where Delee maintains a number of key connections, many women leaders were initially present, but were sidelined by the reification of one male elder by the activists, and consistent with white male aggression that shut down important conversations. She said similar problems had arisen around the Gitmden checkpoint in Wet'suwet'en territories, but in reverse, where young community members, including women, were being widely referred to by outsider activists as chiefs or as other official types of leadership, which they were not, because they politically were aligned with those activists. When I asked Ali what her general experience was of working with anarchists, both in her own territory and in neighboring territories, it was the same response white males moving into spaces and taking things over. Back east at Six Nations, understanding gender politics is crucial. The traditional governance system relies on clan mothers, the titular heads of extended families and kinship groups that cross national lines, to both elevate chiefs to their positions and to remove them if they do not fulfill the will of the people. The clan mothers ultimately hold the majority of political power in traditional Haudenosaunee communities. Since the advent of stained colonial contact and incursion into their territories, the Haudenosaunee have consistently had to struggle against invasive patriarchal practices and values, both transmitted through cultural and educational institutions and reinforced by the insistence of sexist European and settler governments on regarding men only as community leaders. In the present, Six Nations, like many indigenous communities, is engaged in internal struggles to rebuild their governance capacity, including the re-establishment of the importance of women's roles. That all makes for not just the chance, but in fact the overwhelming likelihood that outsiders will blunder into gender politics that they do not understand. Audra contrasted two land reclamation events, the reoccupation of Ganestado in 2006 and the reoccupation of 1492 Land Back Lane that is ongoing, to demonstrate that this is an ongoing problem. In 2006, Audra notes that the clan mothers were on site and maintaining order nearly the entire time, and that this helped to prevent the ex escalation of violence. One of the well-known stories from the 2006 occupation involved OPP officers attempting to bait young men standing on the blockades into conflicts, which would be used as an excuse to swarm the community members with heavily armed riot police. The clan mothers moved through the crowd of protesters, selling, telling some to dial back their anger and even removing those who they feared would lose control. By contrast, the current occupation would start it as an open, peaceful space, similar to autonomous zones that arise in the midst of urban conflicts, and intended as an anarchic space where all supporters could come and contribute, learn about, and be part of the reclamation community. The establishment of permanently occupied tiny homes and frequent organizing of concerts and social events on the space were intended to turn the reclamation site into a community rather than an ongoing protest. However, this has caused two problems. First, the traditional governing structures of the community have been sidelined, as outsiders welcomed into the land back lane site are not under obligation to listen to clan mothers or, in fact, almost anyone with authority in the wider community. Rather, the leadership of the rec reclamation is perceived largely to sit with a group of visible spokespeople, who are largely men. To be clear, this is a perception generated by outsiders, not the reclamation leadership making this claim. This has led to situations where Haudenosaunee women, who have been active in the community for a long time, have asked allies to undertake particular roles or to abstain from action that will provoke violence, such as firing paintballs at police cruisers near the reclamation site, and in response have had the authenticity of their identity and community standing questioned. When Audra questioned some of the actions being taken by both community and outsider activists at Landback Lane, one settler anarchist told Audra, no one thinks you're Mohawk. A grave insult and challenge to make, especially by an outsider to an indigenous person in their own community. There is a clear parallel here to the compensatory division of many anarchic movements, cleaving on lines of communication to establish a strong in-group and keep out infiltrators, whether they be police or moderates, who are both seen as contributing to demobilization. However, the cleaving on these lines ignores the issue of kinship in indigenous communities, which seems to profoundly trouble anarchist practices. 
Part of the reason for discussing all of this is that it is not a theoretical or conceptual issue. It is a real ongoing problem. Several months ago, a prominent settler anarchist, well known for years of solidarity work and a very good friend of one of the key land back lane organizers, was asked to leave the community in the midst of the ongoing conflict. This activist, who is a, has a widespread reputation for serious committed action and who has done time in jail on charges related to major anti-capitalist protests, became considered a liability by too many members of the community. He displayed many of the key problems discussed above, prioritizing the voices of those community members he befriended to the exclusion of all others, acting in a leadership capacity towards both settler and indigenous partic participants in the occupation, openly stating that men who would fight on the front line against police were more valuable to the movement than women, and antagonizing police such that he undermined the authority of the indigenous community leaders in their eyes, as the police read this as an inability by local leadership to control the outsider activist. When he was asked to leave, it was important enough community news that it was reported in the local paper, the Two Row Times. And Audra and Dali have far too many stories of other anarchist activists acting disrespectfully, demanding time, transportation, food, and respect simply because they showed up. As if showing up did not come along with massive disruption and in increased conflict within the community. The white girl with dreads demanding vegan uh, food despite the community already struggling to feed everyone. The loud male organizer who shouted over ceremony because he was busy getting things done. And many others, including a Marxist activist pushed out of the community in the mid-2010s for treating Six Nations as a vanguard in waiting, who, ironically, himself called out activists for similar behaviors during the 2006 occupation. This all needs to be understood as happening against a backdrop where anarchists look to indigenous people as natural allies against invasive capital and colonial states. Meanwhile, anarchists are rarely perceived that way by indigenous people. Audra could not think of a single person she knew to identify as an anarchist who she considered an ally and described most as disruptive more than anything else. Dali recounted her auntie refusing to take part in community actions, including settler anarchists, saying, They're going to be out there doing that anarchist thing, and I don't want anything to do with that. Anarchists' own intents and perceptions aside, it is time to realize that anarchist politics have become a dirty word in many indigenous communities. At the same time, many indigenous communities' experiences of and interactions with anarchists occur not in the material landscape, but online. On social media, anarchists have a terrible record of equating indigenous decolonization struggles with ethno-nationalism ethno and fascism, and generally reading indigenous politics and governance through the lens of state and capital, rather than relationality and kinship. Just recently, social media erupted into a furor when a number of prominent leftist, mostly Marxist, Leninist, or Maoist, but some anarchist as well, accounts declared that quote, land back, was just a Bezos-funded scheme to privatize our, meaning collectivist, lands. Crucially, although some anarchists both participated in and spoke out against this trend, the reaction of many indigenous activists was to perceive yet more proof that anarchists, Marxists, and any other leftists are just colonizers under different labels. Further, anarchists involved in vegan ac advocacy and animal liberation movements have a history of condemning traditional hunting practices as cruel and primitive, while threatening and slandering public figures. Inuk singer and activist Tanya Tagak infamously received a torrent of abuse after posting pictures of her in infant child during a traditional seal hunt, including messages that wished death on her child, who is obviously too young to even participate in the hunt. Anarchists have a bad reputation among many sectors of society. No surprise there, media and governments have parodied anarchist beliefs and actions to scare mainstream public into rejecting anarchism and its positions and efforts. But among indigenous communities, the reputation has been earned by the long-term misaction or inaction of anarchists with respect to indigenous communities. Making pronouncements about the shortcomings of indigeneity, expecting indigenous people to fall in line with socialist revolutions, and failing to build enduring relationships with, relationships with indigenous people outside of times of crisis and conflict have all tip, typified anarchist pratfalls that have provided indigenous communities with well-founded experiential evidence that anarchists aren't all they are claim, claiming to be. Of course, not everyone in the newest social movements gets it wrong when trying to support indigenous communities. Some success, success stories can help us understand what needs to change. 
Audra cited two groups that have supported Land Back Lane effectively in different ways. The first is Black Lives Matter Toronto, who early on in the reoccupation issued a statement of support and then showed up with a huge amount of donated goods and equipment before leaving again. They engaged in mutual aid in an effective way without inserting themselves into community in a way that could be disruptive. Another group consisted of several radical activists who live in a self-sufficient collective in rural Quebec, who prefer not to be named. This group stayed in the community longer, but did so in a non-disruptive way. A smaller group from the commune arrived first with supplies and offering a variety of help and skills. As they came to know the community better, they found more ways to contribute, some of which involved rotating out members from the reclamation site and different members coming in from the commune, depending on whose skills were required at which site and the capacity of individuals to carry out particular tasks. Neither Black Lives Matter nor the collectivists from Quebec ever made a big deal about their support for the reclamation, asked nothing of their hosts, and came prepared to contribute, but not without first listening to what the community needed. What is frustrating is that these stories are the rarity, and that Indigenous communities continue to work nearly as hard to keep their friends in line as they do to keep the police at bay. For anarchists, the lesson is clear. We should be supporting Indigenous decolonization movements, but some of us are not. We should be taking seriously the roles of Indigenous women leaders, the epidemic rates of sexual and gendered abuse in both Indigenous and activist communities, and making stopping this a core of our practice. But we are not. We are often preoccupied with differentiating ourselves and defending our politics from adjacent socialist frameworks, from Marxism to Maoism. But we fail to see that Indigenous communities' experiences with leftists of many stripes break down along very similar lines. Perhaps most importantly, we must stop prioritizing action and fetishizing the front lines when Indigenous people have been engaged in active resistance for centuries against a pervasive settler colonial invasion that means front lines are everywhere. Indigenous activists and community leaders have been telling us this for years. Will we listen? Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.